dispute. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Peter G. Rose, who will be talking to us about the influence of the Dutch on the American kitchen. Now, I have some personal acquaintance with Dutch influence on American culture because I grew up in Westchester County, New York, and was well acquainted with the Van Cortlandt Manor, which was restored during the time that I was living there. And uh, I remember the docents and costumes and hearth cooking and school tours. And it was a huge, huge deal for the town when that happened. And we were surrounded by um, names of places with Dutch influence. So I'm very, very interested in the culinary contributions of the Dutch. Peter has worked as a food writer and syndicated columnist for decades. She's written for Gourmet, Savure, and other magazines in the Netherlands, as well as pub local publications throughout the Hudson Valley area. She's written 10 books, um, starting with The Sensible Cook, uh, Dutch Foodways in the Old and New World, books on celebrations of the Hudson Valley Dutch, and most recently in 2019, her latest book is entitled History on Our Plate, Recipes from America's Dutch Past for Today's Cook. She's been an invited speaker uh, to the Culinary Institute of America, the Smithsonian, um, an exceptionally long list of prestigious universities in the United States and Europe. And we think that you will enjoy learning more about the influence of the Dutch on the American kitchen. So with no further ado, you're not here to hear me speak. Let me introduce our March speaker, Peter G. Rose. Well, thank you, Judy. Um, let's do some screen sharing and uh, I can start my talk. Um, Pat, are you ready for this? I'm ready, take it away. There we are. In this talk on the influence of the Dutch on the American kitchen, I would like to sum up the history of the New World colony, New Netherland, and then I will describe 17th century foodways in the Netherlands itself. Foodways is a word that encompasses uh, not only recipes and preparations, but also social customs, and we'll talk about that later on. I will talk about the foods and methods of preparation the Dutch brought here and how those food ways changed and have become part of the American kitchen. The history of New Netherland begins in 1609. And you might remember that here was celebrated not so long ago. Uh, because that was the year that Henry Hudson, on behalf of the Dutch East India Company, explored the river that would later get his name. And of course, that where Cardinal Hudson is located. His aim, and that's why I'm stressing Dutch East India Company, was to find a northern passage to the Orient. And you get to look at my picture pre-COVID. And after <laughs> that, I will show you a map of New Netherland through Henry Hudson's exploration, the Dutch claim to a vast area between New England and Virginia was established. It was bordered in the north by the Connecticut River and in the south by the Delaware Bay. We know the map really looks different, but you can see it was 
drawn in 1655. Through Hudson's exploration, this vast area was established that is comprised of present day states, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, that might surprise you, parts of Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. So indeed a very large area. In 1621, a charter was given with exclusive trading rights in the Western Hemisphere to the Dutch West India Company. And that's the company that administered this colony, New Netherland. And the Dutch actually called it the province of New Netherland. In 1626, the island of Manhattan was purchased in uh, until 1664. I'm giving you all the dates in a row. Uh, the Dutch retained this area and in 1664, the English took over. There was a brief interlude a decade later, 1673-74, when the Dutch took it back. But after that, it remained in British hands until the American Revolution. Yet only in seven brief decades, those persistent Dutch settlers managed to entrench their culture in this country. 12,000 documents remain from this period. Um, okay, here is the letter that shows us the purchase of the island of Manhattan in 1626. And this letter was written when the first boat came back from the new country. And it also shows that this ship contained a long list of skins of beaver skins, mink, other skins, etc. Because let's not forget the Dutch came here to trade with the natives. It also contained some large wood. Keep in mind the Netherlands doesn't have the kind of forest we have here. 12,000 documents remain from the Dutch period. And this is an example of what it might look like, or like this. Believe it or not, all these documents are being translated by the New Netherlands Research Center in the New York State Library in Albany. Dr. Charles Gehring, very prominent name to remember in New Netherland lore is the person in charge of the translation and has been since 1974. But those documents are not the only remnants of the Dutch period. Every day we eat dishes that can be traced back to the foodways brought here by the early settlers who brought with them, and don't forget, very well established and also well documented foodways. You might have heard that we Dutch are very frugal. We don't throw stuff away. So these documents were saved carefully. 
in the Dutch archives, we have a menu of 1631 that's generally considered to be an example of the daily fare of the common folk. So it has, it lists such dishes as wheat bread soup, um, salted meats, of course, the meats needed to be preserved somehow, a dish that struck my fancy, ground beef with currants. I actually made meatballs with currants and it's pretty darn good. Fish, <laughs> cabbage, beans, peas, bread and cheese were on the menu. Pancakes and porridges were common dishes as well. Menus and account books from orphanages. Remember that frugality, Galatine, never throw anything away. We have all the menus of an orphanage for almost 400 years. They show uh, particularly the menus from the orphanage in Amsterdam the municipal orphanage. And here you see the orphans at the table in the 1600s. Now, the nice thing is the orphanage still exists, or at least the building exists, and it's the Amsterdam Museum. And this painting still hangs there. So if you're going to Amsterdam, you can actually visit it. What do we see? The orphans at the evening meal, actually. And uh, the two girls in the foreground are filling a bowl of porridge. And if you observe carefully, you can see that on the right, four, bowl, four orphans eat from one bowl, uh, which was the common practice. They are served dark bread, which was the bread of the common folk. White bread was called Heerenbrot, or gentleman's bread, it was more expensive and the upper classes ate it mostly. And on the left, you see a girl filling a pitcher of beer. Beer at the time was the common drink because water was already very polluted and if you've ever made beer, you know the water for beer is boiled, so it's safer to drink. The common meal pattern in the Netherlands was uh, comprised of breakfast, midday, possibly an afternoon small meal or snack, and an evening meal just before going to bed. What? Breakfast consisted mainly of bread and butter or, and was served with a soup or um, yeah, a mush, you might call it, of vegetables and very often bread cooked together. Beer was drunk at breakfast and on the farm, buttermilk might have been drunk as well. As you know, tea and coffee became not popular until the end of the 17th century. The midday meal was the meal for which the orphanages kept their menus. It was comprised very often of three dishes, a uh, hutzpah, 
some a dish where everything was cooked together in one pot and hung over the fire and cooked pretty much all day. And then perhaps it was followed by fish or meat, depending on the day. Uh, or a common dish was a stew made with prunes and currants or raisins. And the third dish might be a uh, cooking or we call them cakes, but think more in large cookie type sweet pieces of big good. And that was the whole meal. Although on the farm, a dish of porridge might be served simply and bread and meat. Now, I cannot mention bread enough. Bread accompanied the meal. It was the mainstay of the diet. I talk about the midday meal, but the Netherlands has a famous power. Jacob got so famous and so beloved that he's called Father Cuts, and he wrote a poem about the healthful life and says that it's best to rise at six, eat your midday meal at 10 ish or 10 o'clock to be a healthful person. And that a few hours maybe after the midday meal, surely you're hungry again. Uh, you might eat a snack, particularly if you worked on fields uh, of, again, bread and maybe butter or bread and cheese. And then just before going to bed, the last meal of the day is served. And again, it would be something like bread, butter and cheese, or maybe the leftovers from the midday meal. And then again, porridge was an extremely common dish as well, which you see served in this painting. Once again, the mainstay of the Dutch diet was bread. The Dutch still eat two bread meals a day. The bakers were quite prepared not only regular bread, but also sweet breads and pastries and cookies, or cookies as we call them, of which, of course, the Dutch are very fond. Now, here is a baker at work. Because I have been emphasizing that bread was the mainstay of the diet, because it was the mainstay, it was heavily regulated. Don't think for a moment that regulations, government regulations are something new. In the 17th century in Holland, they were, the bread was strictly regulated and needed to have a certain weight. So you see the baker at work, he's kneading the bread, and then he will put it on this scale to make sure his bread is of proper weight. And the government has said, the weight and the bakers need to follow it, of course. The man on the floor is gathering up reeds to stoke the wall of him with. I mentioned before, the Netherlands doesn't have a lot of forest, so and but they do have swamps with reeds, so reeds were often used to stoke. The, the ovens. 
Now, an other painting here of the St. Nicholas celebration in on December 6th shows some of the specialties. Here is a delicious spice cake that is named for the town where it was most famously made, Daventer. It's a Daventer cook. Here is a spiced speculaus cookie. There are rolls in the basket and there are candies on the table here. But what's very interesting is this large bread called a darfigalter. You don't have to pronounce this. I'll do it for you. These <laughs> darfigalters were breads that were particularly made for the St. Nicholas period from December 6th through Epiphany. Now, why did I show you this? Because we have the Deacon's record of the Flatbush Avenue Reef, Dutch Reformed Church that show that these kind of breads were given by the Dutch um, to the poor during this period on New Year's Day. So everyone received a darifikata if the, you were felt to be poor. Bread was purchased from the baker or oftentimes it was made ready at home and baked in the baker's oven. Again, here comes the lack of fuel into play. It was better to have a central oven in the village or you know, several of them in a larger town and have the bread baked there. People, and particularly the baker, would give his bread a special mark, a bread mark on the bottom of the breads. And this was still a, a custom in the 18th century where I, I found uh, this list of bread marks in the city of Leiden Municipal Archives. Now, a housewife, and there are samples on here, uh, would have her own bread mark so that bread overseers would be able to identify each person's bread. Another interesting painting here um, is your Berg had his baker who blows his horn. Very interesting. In the front, we see the common bread that was regulated. And you can see how you could make your bread mark on the bottom of that. <clears throat> In the basket are all sorts of delicious rolls. And on the side here are rolls called schootjes because they were, you were able to put a lot of these rolls that were put, pushed together in the oven with one schout or shot. On the um, hanger here are the pretzels, very common pretzels, slightly sweet, not like the German salty ones. Um, and we have recipes for those. Now, why is he 
blowing his horn. He is blowing his horn to let his clientele know, hey, come and get it, bread is ready. This custom of blowing your horn was brought here as well. Yes, we know because there is a court case in those documents that tells that a baker blew his horn one morning before his bread was actually ready. So he was brought to court. <laughs> and, well, because bread was so important, it was annoying to be called to the bakery when there was the bread wasn't quite done. Waffles, wafers, pancakes, puffer juice, which are a puffed tiny pancake made in a pan with small indentations. Some of you might know the uh, Danish Abloskiver. This is a similar pan, but the puffed pancakes are smaller and not filled with anything. Those were the things that were made at home, uh, including, of course, only cooking, and I'll show them to you in a minute, which are deep fried balls of dough with or without a filling. And here is a woman with a pot full of them. And today they still look the same. So, and uh, it's my opinion that these are the forerunners of the American donuts. There are many paintings that show um, people making pancakes and I'll happily show you. One here, Willem Bouteweg made a drawing of women sitting on typical low chairs at the hearth with a long handled pancake pan, which as you see hangs um, rests on a trivet that hangs from a trammel. They have baked already or fried um, a lot of them and keeping them warm on a footstool very, very handily. And here's another painting. I believe this hangs in the museum in Boston. Again, a long Tra uh, trivet hanging from a trammel. She has a little knife in her hand to loosen the pancakes. And then she'll uh, turn them over flapjack style. And handily the batter pot is nearby. And just in case the batter gets thick, then she has a jug of milk handy. While orphanage menus and account books tell us a lot about the diet of the masses, a period cookbook entitled, uh oh, hang okay. here. Here we are, entitled The Verstandige Kok, which is the book I translated as The Sensible Cook. That helps us understand the more affluent middle class, such as the family we see here. Uh, that I'm going to show you in a minute, but I'd like you to take a good look at the frontispiece of the kitchen. This is a rich family's house. 
it has a um, ball oven and uh, it's here they're roasting roasts as you can see and it has the beginning of a stove all readily prepared then here Good afternoon again, everyone. Here we are. I, we had a power outage and needed to, of course, of course, stop recording. In fact, we were forced to. We'll pick up where we left off. I showed you a picture of the frontispiece of the main book of the 17th century written in Dutch, the Verstandige Kok. And this was the book for the affluent middle class, which was rapidly rising at that time. And these people at the table uh, show what that middle class might have looked at. It's a family at the table. It says specifically Protestant family because this was the time that the Dutch fought an 80 year war with Spain. Um, the Spanish king who actually owned the area of, New, of ne the Netherlands wanted to force the Catholic religion upon the Dutch and they had in the meantime converted to Protestantism. So therefore this is in a way a kind of protest painting if you wish. They're very affluent. Look at the beautiful color, but there is a subtle hint of this affluence. The bread on the table, the bread is all white. White bread was known or was talked about as Heerenbrot or gentleman's bread. It was more um, expensive than the plain dark bread uh, that the common folk ate. So uh, this is just a subtle hint, but there it is. These middle class people ate well, and the cookbook shows it. It was part of a larger volume. It was tucked in the back, so to speak, of a large volume called it Vermakelijk Landleven, meaning the pleasurable country life. And the whole book contained extensive sections on orchards, beekeeping, herbs, distilling medicine and food prepar preservation. All of this in one book. And in my research on Dutch foodways, I had come across a copy of that book in the archives of historic Hudson Valley and was later asked to translate it as the cookbook specifically as the sensible cook. Since the book, the whole book that is, contains such a wealth of information on subjects important to everyday life, it seems highly probable that the pleasurable country life was among the many books the Dutch settlers 
uh, would ask their family in Holland or their connections in Holland to send to them. And we know, know many of them did. There are still letters preserved that ask for specific things, seeds, books, tree stock, all kinds of things. The sensible cook helps us understand the well-established 17th century Dutch food ways in the Netherlands. After all, cookbooks codify already existing recipes. It also helps create a framework of information on New Netherland derived from a variety of sources and archaeological evidence. The book's recipes abound with rather exotic items, but the kind of items that Dutch seafarers brought from far away lands. Items such as lemons, mace, nutmeg, and pepper. And here is a lovely painting, again, with the white bread, oysters, a beautiful salt dish, those kind of dishes you find in the museums and, and uh, historic houses up and down the Hudson Valley. And the Metropolitan Museum has one too. But on the left, what's of interest is a twist of paper with pepper. And this is the way pepper was sold. He went to the apothecary. The person there would tear out a page from the almanac and wrap up your pepper. So that's what's shown here. Now, I know many of you liked the paintings I'm showing you. I have a real treat for you with the next four paintings. I am using four paintings by Joachim Birklar, which illustrate the full spectrum of recipes from salads and vegetables, meat, fish, poultry, baked goods, um, raised pies and pastries that you'll find in the Sensible Cook. So here goes with Joachim Birkner, who shows us a full range of vegetable markets. And I'll read you the list of vegetables we can identify here apples, artichokes, forest strawberries, right here, um, grapes, peas, raspberries, cherries, cabbage, you can't miss it here, red cabbage and savoy cabbage, squash, we call it, and prunes, broad beans, turnips, onions, and red and orange carrots in the foreground. An astonishing array of uh, produce, but it was all available already. This was painted in 1569. In his next painting, you'll notice the haunch of uh, meats and more in the foreground as well as poultry. But also look at the dishes and how one of the servants is hanging a pot to cook in the fire. Let me go back to that. I click, oops. 
Um, there we are. Sorry. And here are some pewter dishes for serving as well as a cooking pot. In the next painting, Birkelar portrays a fish market with a dish of herring. And one of the reasons the Dutch Republic flourished was because of catching herring in abundance. You notice, of course, the salmon, uh, again, a, quite a display of fish, perch, roach, bream, codfish, carp, thornback, place, pike, sprat, salmon, and tench are all portrayed in here. And of course, when the Dutch came here, they immediately fished for various things available, fish available here. And then a poultry market, and you note that uh, not only what we expect chickens and other poultry were eaten, but alas, also songbirds and various other birds, as we can see in this beautiful painting. We also know, although they're not shown here, that peacocks, swans, and herons were eaten as well. Then um, in the best of the still lives that I'm going to show you, I will show you that swans indeed were part of the menu. This is clearly a rich man's kitchen. Look at all the roast. There are at least three or four servants, actually four, uh, as well as a dog, of course. And, uh, but what we ogle at, so to speak, is this magnificent swan pie on the left. And I have uh, the tail for you so you can see how beautifully this is done. The trick with making these pies, and I've made them though never of a swan, but a turkey, is that you have to very carefully skin the bird, set aside the skin and feathers, and then finally reconstruct it on the pie. And that's what's done here. Note the fresh water pearl, the silk flowers, and the lovely crown the bird has gotten. And it sits on top of a raised pie. Now, these, of course, were not uh, for normal dinners but for special occasions to amaze and delight your guest. There were other ways to at least delight them, if not amaze them. And that's by way of this wonderful banquet we see here with uh, small pastries. Many of them were filled with almond paste. In the front, we see candies, candied cinnamon bark, and of course, Jordan almonds. No American wedding can be without them, and they were already eaten in the late 16th, early 17th century. On the right, 
you see one of the recipes in the first cook or the sensible cook is for preserving. And one of the ways of doing so is making fruit leather. Here, no doubt, you know, is quince paste. Quince, when cooked, becomes quite red. And it was put in this box, uh, split wood box to dry. And then it can be just peeled off and eaten the way children eat, eat it today. Now that I've set the stage and have outlined to you the kinds of foods and recipes the Dutch used in the Netherlands, let's look at what happened when they came to America. Those practical merchants who formed the Dutch West India Company intended that the colony be not only self-sufficient, but also able to put vision the ships that were engaged in the Atlantic trade. The settlers brought with them fruit trees, such as apples, pears, peaches, vegetables, such as lettuces, cabbages, you saw the picture of the enormous cabbage, parsnips, carrots, beets, and herbs like parsley, rosemary, chives, or tarragon. They brought farm animals as well. And they, each animal had its separate stall on board ship and had the attendant who would get a bonus if the animal arrived safely. The new land was very fertile. Jakob Steendam, one of the three major Dutch American poets of New Netherland, called the colony a land of milk and honey. Adrian van der Donk, who wrote a description of New Netherlands and that has been translated and is available in print presently. I highly recommend you read it if you have an interest in New Netherland and what happened there when the settlers just settled, settled. And Adrian von der Donk in 1655 says that European fruits and vegetables thrive well. And he marvels at the native fish, fowl, and other wildlife that is available in great abundance. As Especially, he talks about oysters that he had seen a foot long and broad in proportion. So enormous oysters were found in the new colony. Trade with Native Americans was an important aspect of life in New Netherlands. In fact, the main reason. The Dutch traded cloth, beads, ironware for beaver skins. Ironware such as the kettle you see in this lovely painting, again of a busy kitchen with always a dog present who can eat the little pieces that fall from the tables. These kettles, by the way, made a great impact on Native American food preparation. They eventually replaced the earthenware pots that had been used prior to the Dutch arrival. 
From ship records, we know that the West Indian ships brought the settlers the kitchen tools such as frying pans to fry the pancakes we saw in the beginning of the talk or the irons to make their hard and soft waffles. And he, here is a painting that shows quite the array of kitchenware. <clears throat> The woman is saying, well, she fell asleep. And in the meantime, you can see the cat is getting away with the food. Uh, but it's of interest because of the, the kitchenware that is portrayed, the kind of kitchenware that would have been brought here as well. The Dutch also used their baking skills to produce breads, sweet breads, and cookies to trade with Native Americans who really valued the bread the Dutch had. It was wheat bread, particularly in the area of what's now Albany. And they, of course, didn't know it. We have a diary from Harman Manders from the Bohart, and he tells that he was more than a day's walk away from Fort Orange, meaning in the Albany area, that he encountered a Mohawk Indian who had just come from the fort and offered him a piece of wheat bread. In their new country, the colonists continued to prepare the dishes they were used to, such as coleslaw or kolsla, which is the way it's pronounced in Dutch. Kol means cabbage, sla means salad. We have a diary of a um, century later, 1749, an assistant to Linnaeus came to the New Netherlands area and recorded what the Dutch ate and the kind of foodstuffs that were available. He says his Dutch landlady served him a, an unusual salad. It was cabbage cut into long strips, dressed with a melted butter and vinegar and salt and pepper, dressing uh, and mixed well to distribute the butter. According to Peter Kahn, it tasted better than one can imagine. And I hope you'll try to make coleslaw with melted butter. Let it stand at room temperature for about an hour to wilt the cabbage slightly. And you'll see it's marvelous, particularly if you use good vinegar and a little salt and pepper. It's really very good that way. I told you in the beginning we would talk about social customs because New Netherland settlers continued their customs. And we know this from handwritten cookbooks belonging to their descendants. And remaining diaries as well show this. For instance, for funerals, they prepared dote cookies. This is Mariah Valenslier's handwritten cookbook, probably from the end of the 17th century. And she describes for 300 cookies, meaning cookies, and that's where the word, uh, the 
American word comes from. You use 20 pounds of sugar, 10 and a half of butter, and 50 pounds of flour. You make them, and that makes 300 cookies, which is just about what you need, because another diary says they had a, a bushel basket full of these funeral biscuits. I made them. They're not very good. However, they become a lot better if you dunk them in malt wine. And we know malt wine was served at funerals. And here is the recipe. 10 gallons of wine, 5 gallons of water, and cinnamon, nutmeg, and cloves as well as 14 pounds of sugar. And it will make a lot of malt wine. And if you dunk your cookie in it, it tastes a lot better in my opinion. Uh, I have found almost 40 of these kind of handwritten cookbooks belonging to descendants of the settlers. Uh, there is one regarding the festivities surrounding a birth. The woman who just had the baby is in bed still. The custom was she'd stay for nine days after the birth. A neighbor or a friend or a relative came to admire the swaddled baby, and she will be served this drink. And I have a detail. It's called Condale. Uh, in Dutch, it's spelled K A N D E E L. In that sounds like Con, C O N D A L E. This is a drink of white wine and egg. So you can see it's separated on the bottom, but there is a cinnamon stick that will stir it up. In the Zotinic Cook or Rusk is a supply of those candy. Uh, cinnamon barks and other good candies that also were typical to be served. And a version of this custom, as well as the drink, is still traditional in the Netherlands today. When our present day King was born in 1967. The royal family served this kind of refreshment. Because of their efforts this, uh, to, to make life in New Netherlands resemble that of home, Everyday life in New Amsterdam probably bore a great resemblance to that of the Netherlands as depicted in the following uh, four, 14 uh, slides I have for you. They are drawings by Leonard Bramer, a painter illustrated in the city of Delft. He shows everyday people doing everyday things. And we will go to the first one. You see someone selling cabbages and carrots. Look at the beautiful bunch of carrots. Then someone selling onions still are braided and we still see braids of onions at 
farmer's markets at times. And there are turnips as well. Now, cabbages and carrots and onions were very often cooked together to make what was called an hutzpot. And we know that those were eaten in New Netherlands as well, because in those 12,000 documents that remain from the Dutch period, I found a court case that talks about a hutzpot being stolen. Now that can refer to the pot itself, the large cooking pot, or to the content, or both. Turnips were sold from a little boat in the canal. Adrian van der Donk in his book tells that the turnips are in New Netherland are as sweet and hard as in the homeland, which of course was high praise. Then there were apples sold from a nice wooden wheelbarrow. The colonists brought various kinds of apples here. Another diary tells that uh, the man had never seen finer apples. The fun thing is that some of these old varieties are still grown in the Hudson Valley. Uh, two varieties to mention are the Zwaar apple. Zwaar means heavy, it's a large apple, and the Spitzenberg. Here is butter sold outside. And I'm sure the woman has her little dish ready to take half of those little <laughs> uh, containers that the woman carries. And we go on. There is milk sold on the streets. And I had a young friend here and who looked at this. Uh, I'm sure most of you know this is a yoke that would be on her shoulders and it was a way of carrying the pails of milk. But he had no idea. It's fun to see uh, how enlightening some of these drawings and paintings can be. Uh, more butter painting, here we go. More interesting, we have barrels of oysters. Those were loaded on Dutch ships that would come here to provision and taken to into the Atlantic for trade there. And we know there were a lot of oysters to be found here. This is a fun one. If you look carefully, it's a rabbit hanging upside down. Here are his ears. Um, of course, rabbits were here in abundance. Coney Island was derived from the Dutch name of Konijnen Eiland, uh, and uh, it became anglicized to Coney Island. We have various nuts, hazelnuts, walnuts, all kinds of nuts. In the diaries, it tells how visitors who came to visit a Dutch family always were served nuts really cracked. 
and here are more nuts, um, walnuts, I believe. And then hard waffles, if they were called in English, or wafers, cinnamon wafers, according to the title of the drawing, sold on the street. And then there is the opposite, which are soft waffles or uh, the waffles we know nowadays uh, very well for breakfast. Note how the woman in the background has is using what is a portable brazier and she has her waffle iron and is making some to be sold by this woman. And this lucky boy already is eat, eating one. Then here is a recipe page from the Von Cortland book, Knit 18th century, uh, that talks about to make hard waffles. This is the Dutch spelling waffles clearly. And on the bottom is a uh, soft waffle, a recipe. As I told you, I have found about 40 of these books by now. And finally, we come to Aqua Vita is the title of the drawing or brandy and really the root of all evil in those documents that remain, there are a lot of court cases about the use and particularly, of course, the misuse of brand. It is precisely the recipes for waffles, only cooking, wafers, cookies, and pancakes acknowledged to be specifically Dutch that can be traced through manuscript cookbooks handed down from generation to generation in families such as the von Cortlands, the von Rensselaers, or the Lefferts in Brooklyn. They show the continued identification with the forebears. Although many descendants might have forgotten the native tongue, and they did, they did not forget the taste of the foods of their ancestors and continued to enjoy the pastries and other items connected with feasts and holidays, not only well into the 19th century, but to the present day. The next time you have a donut for breakfast, enjoy that crunchy coleslaw in a small dish with your sandwich at lunch, or eat a cookie for your afternoon tea, you too will be perpetuating food ways brought here by Dutch settlers almost 400 years ago. Thank you.